being uh, flexible on the timing there. So my name's Simon, I'm from Acquia. I'm here to introduce the Drupal Core Initiatives keynote. Um, but uh, I just want to say I'm really excited to be here. This is my 10th DrupalCon, and this is the first time they've let me on the big stage. So <laughs> it's a really big occasion for me today. Um, I've got exactly three minutes. Cla clock is counting down very quickly here. Uh, and I thought, what, what should I do? And I thought, I'll give away some shoes. So would anybody like a pair of these? Fantastic. <laughs> Trainers. Right, so can everybody stand up? We've got the lights on in the house. If everybody can stand up, what we're going to do is we're going to find one special person in the audience to give away some uh, DrupalCon, Acquia, Drupal, Converse trainers too. So I thought it would be interesting to find the newest person in the audience here. And I know we've got a bunch of people who this is their first DrupalCon, but they're people even newer than that. So first of all, if you've been to a DrupalCon before, can you all sit down? Everyone who's been to a DrupalCon before? I want to see the scale of what I'm working with here. <laughs> First of all, we should thank all of these people who sit down for being like long-standing members of the community. So uh, thank you to everybody who's just sat down. Well done. <laughs> right, next question. Do you own a pair of Drupal or Acquia socks? If you do, can you sit down? <laughs> I thought more people would sit down. Hang on, if I give you these, will you sit down? <laughs> <laughs> and, wh and what about you? There you go. Thank you very much. Right, now then, have you been to a locally organized Drupal camp before? If you've been to a locally organized Drupal camp, sit down. Oh, I've got a long list of these. I wasn't sure how long it's going to take me to go through them all. <laughs> right. Have you made a contribution on Drupal.org? Some documentation? something to a module. If you have, sit down. We're getting through the crowds here. Um, do you own a Drupal mug? Don't worry, I'm not gonna throw mugs at you, but if, if you own a Drupal mug, please sit down. Right, and do you have a profile? This should get a bunch of people. Have you got a profile on Drupal.org? Ah. Oh. We're doing really well. How many? I can't really see over there. Can you wave your arms if you're still standing? Brilliant. Uh, over there. Oh, we're, uh, that's worked really well. Great. So we're going to change the competition a little bit now. It's going to be a hands up or hands down competition, OK? So uh, when I ask a question, it's either hands up for one answer or hands down for the other answer. So this should kind of get us down to the last few people, hopefully. What are the currently supported versions of Drupal? Is it hands up for Drupal 7 and 8, hands down for 7 and 9? Come on, hands up or down? What do you reckon? What do you reckon? 7 and 8, hands up, hands down for 7 and 9. Have you all decided? Good. Right, if you were hands up, it's time to sit down, I'm afraid. Ah, uh, the currently supported versions of Drupal are seven and nine. How many people have we got? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven people left, eight people left. Right. Here's, this is a question that comes up all the time in this community. Is Dries Belgian or is he from the Netherlands? So, <laughs> hands, hands up if you think he's from the Netherlands. Hands down, if you think he's from Belgium. Have you all decided? Everybody around these people, I need you to witness this so we don't get any changes of mind. So, uh, what do they say? Hands up for the Netherlands, hands down for Belgium. Right, if you've got your hands up, it's time to sit down, I'm afraid. How many people have we got left? One, two, three, four, five, six people, right. We've got two and a half minutes because of the extra time. So, <laughs> I'm going to keep going through. Lucky I had a long list of questions, isn't it? When was Drupal first released? When did Dries start using it for his, his first project? Was it January the 15th in 2001? 
or January the 16th, 2001. <laughs> right. If you, if you think it was January the 15th, put your hands in the air. If you think it was January the 16th, hands down. We, everyone decided? We got a high bunch of people who got this right. His hands in the air. January the 15th was the day that Dries says that he started using Drupal. <laughs> right, what else have I got on my list here that I can ask you? When will Drupal 10 be released? I mean, this isn't a promise by me. This is, <laughs> this is the current projection. So will it be released, hands up, for December of this year or hands down for January of next year? How many people have we got? One, two, three. Hands up for December, hands down for January. It is December, so one, two, three people left. Is that all we've got left? Three people? Four people. Right. I've got 50 seconds left. <laughs> Yikes. Right. Um, I'm going to ask one more question, and then we're going to go for, like, closest to a number to find the last person. So uh, when was DrupalCon last in Prague? Was it in 2012 or 2013? Hands up for 2012. Hands down for 2013. So the answer is 2013. So if your hands down, how many people have we got left standing? Can you just shout out? One, two, three. Okay, I'm going to ask you all a question. You've got to shout out a number one by one. We'll start over here. How many, num how many members are in the Drupal community? It's whoever gets closest. This is how many people have registered to the Drupal community in uh, the last, how many years is it? Come on, you, you're in charge, you must know. <laughs> in the last long time, since the Drupal, 21 years, in the last 21 years, how many people have signed up to be a member of the Drupal community? Can you shout a number? 10? <laughs> I think you can sit down now. <laughs> <laughs> a thousand. Right, where, who's next? Was there somebody over here? A million. <laughs> Who's over here? Is anyone left over here? One person? A million and one. <laughs> that, <laughs> that is some sneaky guessing, right? The exact answer, or well, the actual answer, is 1.39 million. So. <laughs> Can you tell me your name, please? I, I can't hear you. Let me run over. Lee. That was a long way to run for Lee. Um, so, if everybody at Lee, if you come and find me on the Aquia stand later today, I'll uh, give you a pair of these smart trainers. And if everybody else can welcome the newest member to the Drupal community, Lee. <laughs> And with that, I'm going to hand over to uh, Gabor, who's going to run the core initiatives keynote. Initiative leads keynote. So we have this keynote here because we think it's really important for you to meet the people that lead these initiatives. I think it gives a lot of insights into how they how they build their teams, how, what they are struggling with, how they organize their work, the happenstance of open source, how you can be involved, uh, what kind of skills uh, open source. Uh, initiatives needs 
So there's a lot of different aspects that you can learn here. And also, you can meet them in person, and you can see that they are very friendly people, and uh, then you have the chance to meet them all throughout the conference. So anybody can be a part of these initiatives that we are talking about here. They are the leads that are making it happen. So that's why we have this session. For here, if you have a question for this session, there's going to be hand mics distributed throughout the venue. But if you uh, installed the mobile app or if you are an online participant to the conference, you're not here, then you need to use this online tool. So if you have the mobile app, then you go into the program uh, area. There you pick the keynote and there's a live Q&A tab there. And you can submit your questions there. People can vote on the questions and then we'll use them as part of the Q&A at the end. This also gives a chance for our online participants to participate in the Q&A. So you can either submit your questions there or use the mics at the end. And with that, I would like to welcome all of our initiative keynote speakers on stage. So first up is Ted Bowman, then Alex Pott, then Marine Gandhi, then Neil Drum, Leslie Glenn, and Laurie Escola. And I would like to invite Lenny Moskalik, who's going to lead the Q&A as well. And this is a strange keynote because I will sit there as well. I usually don't speak at these keynotes, but unfortunately Bjorn Brala couldn't make it to this keynote, so I'm stepping in for him. But first, let's hear from Laurie Escola about CK Editor 5. So I'll talk about the differences between CK Editor 4 and CK Editor 5. CK Editor 4 has served us well for the last nine years. As always, software comes to its end of life at some point, and so does CK Editor 4. So, let's take a look at how the current experience is with CK Editor 4. I'm dragging an image to the editor, and, as, uh, and if, we, if we look at the source, it was uploaded as a data URI. That's not ideal. So basically with CK Editor 4, to upload an image, you'll have to enter the image upload dialog. Realigning the image or adding a caption also happens to the, di uh, to the dialog. This is kind of distracting my uh, editor editorial workflow. So here comes CK Editor 5. We can do, do things better with it. So CK Editor 5 is a full rewrite of CK Editor. It comes with the better UX, accessibility, and and a vastly improved developer experience. So let's take a look at how all of this looks like with CK Editor 5. I'm dragging an image to the editor. Um, so instead of a data URI, the image was now uploaded to Drupal. So that's better. I can also enter an, enter an alt text using the CK Editor balloon instead of a dialog. Adding a caption also happens by just clicking a button. So this is great. So how do I get to use CK Editor 5? All you have to do is enable the CK Editor 5 module, which ships with Drupal, uh, Drupal 9.3, 9.4, 9.5. And then you have to go to your text format and switch from CK Editor 4 to CK Editor 5. And, auto and, and our automatic upgrade path takes care of the rest. Please review the changes manually because there's it's not a one-to-one -one conversion. The goals for the CK Editor 5 project has been to ensure that there's zero data loss. So what that means is that with any configuration of CK Editor 4, and any kind of content that is stored in the database, when, when content is being restated with CK Editor 5, there should be no data loss. Basically, your content should still remain in the database as a result of that. But the second goal has been to make the upgrade path as smooth as possible. So as you saw earlier, it is as smooth as just switching the editor on the text format. This is true also for con contributed modules which is, uh, that support uh, the CK Editor 5 and provide an upgrade path. Our third goal has been to rebuild all of our integrations to match the CK Editor 5 built in UX. So for example, we've had to rebuild our media integration to match the experience that we saw earlier on the image upload. So media can be realigned and captions can be added without never having to enter a dialogue. Uh, so Wim Beers gave an update earlier this year in one of these initiative lead updates at Drupal Dev Days. Back then we had plenty of upstream blockers, missing functionality, and critical bugs remaining. So now six months later, and 150 completed issues later, CK Editor 5 is finally stable in Drupal 9.5.0. 
So who's behind this? Here's all the contributors who have got, uh, helped us get where we are right now. Uh, so let's give a round of applause for everyone who's contributed. None of this would have been possible without the help of CK Source, who is the company behind CK Editor. They've put an enormous amount of effort into making sure that Drupal can upgrade to CK Editor 5, and CK Editor 5 is fully compatible with everything that Drupal needs. So let's give another round of applause for them as well. We could use some help with testing the CK Editor 4 to CK Editor 5 upgrade path. We've prepared some documentation that provides instructions for how to test the upgrade path on your site and how to report any problems that you run into whilst you're upgrading to CK Editor 5. Uh, now, is also the time, now is a good time for contributed modules to start updating. We've started making very good progress on updating CK Editor 4 modules to CK Editor 5, but there's still a lot of work that needs to happen. So if you are a, a contributed module maintainer that depends on CK Editor, now is the time to do, uh, do the update because our CK Editor 5 module is stable, so the APIs are not going to change anymore. We're going to run CK Editor office hours tomorrow at 3 p.m. at the D8 1x internet room where we can provide help uh, if, you need, if, if, that, if that would help you to, to port your module to be compatible with CK Editor 5. We're gonna have some folks from the CK source there and I'm going to be there. So let's make this happen. Thank you. Thank you, Larry. Uh, I would also highlight Victor's session later today about CK Editor 5, what to look forward to. I think is a really good, it provides a really good insight into what else CK Editor 5 provides and all of the advanced functionality that is made possible uh, by the new version. So uh, that's a good option to go as well. Uh, so next up is Leslie Glynn and she will talk to us about the Project Browser Initiative. Thank you, Gabor. Hi, I'm Leslie Glenn, one of the Project Browser Initiative leads. Um, after the introducing you to the Project Browser Initiative, I hope to show how everybody in this room can contribute to helping us move this initiative forward. Uh, I have the slides at bit.ly, PBIL 22, which is Project Browser Initiative leads 22. There's a lot of links in this slideshow there for demo purposes only though. Um, so what is the Project Browser Strategic Initiative? The initiative was first introduced by Dries at DrupalCon North America in 2021. Uh, the goal was to make it easy for site builders to, to find and install modules. In Portland earlier this year, Dries emphasized the goal, want to be able to um, make it easy to, to browse and install modules. So what problem are we trying to solve? If creating a Drupal site is easy, then what? One of the first things people want to do is to add functionality to the website. It's like walking into a grocery store, there's a million modules, a million cereal boxes. How do you begin your search? The project browser is currently a contrib module. We released a beta version of the module in July, thanks to all the contributors that helped with that. Um, if you click on the Try It Now button on the project browser pro uh, project page, you can spin up Drupal site using Gitpod. Uh, Gitpod is, is, will create a fully functional Drupal 9 site with the project browser installed. What you need is a GitLab or GitHub account, or you can just sign in to use Gitpod. Once a site appears in the top right corner of the screen, just expand it and your website will open up in a full window. <clears throat> Once um, you get there, you'll get a URL that you can share across the internet with others so they can use your fully functioning site as well to test things out. Log in with admin admin and then click on the, there's a new link under extend to browse modules and that's how you get to the project browser window. The project browser today, uh, the default filters we've, we've come up with are modules that are compatible with the site, the, the version of the site that you're running Drupal on, that have security coverage and that are maintained. The default sort is the most popular modules. So you'll see, you, when you search, you'll see categories, you'll see a card or a list view of the modules. So we have a, a lot of contribution opportunities this week. The first two are later today. Um, we have two birds of a feather sessions on usability testing. So come, check it out, try it out, give us feedback, what works, what doesn't work, what we can improve on. That would be super helpful, easy for anyone, including those who are brand new to Drupal. 
Uh, the content is critical to the success of the project browser. You want to go browse for modules, but the first things you see are the most critical. So the first things we're working on is adding a logo, uh, adding a project summary, which is just a short, non-technical description, and updating the categories. Um, there are meta tickets that we created for the, the most popular top 100 modules um, that are created that you can work on, very simple. Uh, we, we're going to review the three child issues there. Like I say, create the logo, the short description, and the categories. And then we'll get these over to the maintainers to actually look at what we suggest and put those into their modules. So the first thing is to propose or, or review a logo. We feel that logos are helpful. So we need designers. If you're a designer out there, spend 15 minutes, create a logo for us. Really easy contributions. So please help us out with that or review logos that other have, others have done. Um, the next thing is propose a short, non-technical description, something that someone, our, our target audience is those new to Drupal uh, and site builders. You know, give us a nice description that would be helpful for them when they're searching for modules. Limit 200 characters, so start with that. Um, the thing after that is the categories. Right now there's, I think, 55 categories. Um, so. Think about what the top three categories are that people would want to find this module using those, that search and help us suggest what those top three should be. We have a uh, Kanban board for the top 100 modules. Um, this is, makes it easy for you to just go to this link, find things to work on 15 minutes in your day. You know, help us create a logo or a short description or some categories. So there's a needs work, which are the issues that, you know, the modules that need help. Needs review, come in and just review something that other people have done. Anybody can do this. We're looking for site builders you know, and new people to help with there too. I talked about the categories. Uh, they're, they're gonna be a key for finding modules. There are currently 55 of them. In our interviews with you know, our target audience, you know, um, it's completely overwhelming. So help us you know, delete some of those categories, add new ones, combine some of those. The same with the project detail pages on Drupal.org. None of those are the same. They're not consistent. It's very difficult for our target audiences to know what to find where on the project pages. So, you know, what content is most important for people when they decide what modules to use? So we're working on possibly a template for the project pages to help with that, because that's what's gonna be displayed on the cards in the project browser. More contribution opportunities. Um, Wednesday and Thursday, both at 15 o'clock. Uh, first, we're doing the, cat the project pages, I'm sorry, and then on Thursday, we'll talk about the categories. Just come, discuss that with us. How can you help out? Uh, Chris will be in the general contribution room, and I'll be in the mentor contribution room all week. So how can you join after today? Join Project Browser on Drupal Slack. We have a, sub a site builder subcommittee meeting on Tuesdays. We have a general meeting on Wednesdays. Both of those are in Slack. Uh, and check out the issue queue. Two other initiatives you're gonna hear about today, the automatic updates with Ted Bowman and the distributions and recipes with Alex Pott. Those both have a lot to do and real, really help the project browser out. So, um, you know, come to anything this week about those two things as well. And tomorrow, at right after the keynote, Chris and I are having a more, more detailed presentation on the project browser where we're at, what have we accomplished, what do we hope to accomplish, so we hope to see you there. Um, thank you to all the contributors. We have a ton of contributors. I couldn't create a slide, we've had so many, uh, like uh, he did, so thank you all. Thank you. Thank you. So I really like the Project Browser Initiative because it makes all of the work that you do all on Drupal.org much more visible for Drupal users. It brings all of this functionality that's available in Drupal, but many people don't know about them, available to them. So I, I think it's really powerful for the future. And with that, I would like to introduce the next speaker, which is myself. So, um, <laughs> so you haven't had me enough on stage yet. So I'm stepping in from Bjorn Brala because I thought this is a really important topic that we should talk about, and it's this project update bot. And actually what I would like to talk about is more the, the open source case study behind the project update bot, how we almost accidentally worked together with multiple companies to make this happen. That's very critical now 
for the community. But first, why do we need the project update button in the first place? Is that because with Drupal 8 onwards, we've introduced this system where we have new APIs and deprecated APIs in a major version. And then the next major version, we remove the deprecated APIs and keep the new ones. And we need to support the community to go through this process, to adopt these new APIs and remove the use of the deprecated APIs. And we wanted to automate as much of that as possible. And we do this by detecting what needs to be changed, by fixing these changes in this bot, and then posting the changes in the issue queues for people to review them. So these are three areas where we needed to have tools. And as I've said, kind of accidentally, we now have all of these tools in place. So what, what it ends up with is a patch in the issue queue. So this is the JSON API extras, which is Bjorn's, one of Bjorn's modules. It posts a patch in the issue queue, and then it needs humans to come in and review the patch and the CI systems to run and make sure that the tests pass. And when the humans review them and commit them, make releases, then it's available for the whole community. But it all started back in 2019 with Matt Glamen at Centaro, who was working on code quality checking tools with Centaro Toolbox. And he kind of accidentally stumbled on the possibility of using PHP stand for deprecation checking. And they got roped into writing Drupal check as a deprecation checking tool for the community. So that's where all the checking uh, things started. And then Zoltan and myself in Hungary decided that we need a user interface on top of this to make this easier to use. So we built upgrade status on top of this, which is project aware and Drush integrated. And it has a bunch of additional checks on top of what's in uh, PHP stand Drupal and also has environment checking. So this can be used to check the readiness of your whole site, not only specific code bases. But at the same time, Duane at Pantheon decided, totally independently of us, that we should look at the country projects. And he wrote a shell script that was checking 1,600 country projects readiness for Drupal 9. And then he posted big spreadsheets of data that we started looking at and analyzing. And so we had an idea of where country readiness is for Drupal 9. And then Ryan and the Drupal Association decided, oh, this looks nice. What if we automate this on the VA infrastructure? So he wrote a script that runs every week for the past three years now and runs this same process. And now we have data of 9,000 country projects every week and their readiness for the next major version. So this is all built on top of each other. And this data was used by Dries in the Dries node in 2019 October to present the readiness of the Drupal ecosystem to Drupal 9. So that he could show like this is how far we are. And he also called for automation of these fixes. Uh, so that's where, that's where the idea of the project update came from. But before that, uh, I looked at this and I decided that, by the way, it would be much better to have this data that was in the Dries node available for anyone. So I built a deprecation status dashboard that takes the data from project analysis from the DA and displays it in a much better digestible form. And so it's available for you to dive in and see project status and it helps us prioritize work on things. Uh, half a year before that, Dejo at Pronovix was already experimenting with Drupal 8 Rector. Uh, it was not ready for prime time, prime time yet, but he was experimenting with what about this code quality fixing and deprecation fixing tool could be useful for the community. And it was useful. It was already around when Dries said that we need this fixing, but it was not ready, so offer. And then at Palantir decided that we should fix this up and add a bunch more checks to it. So they started uh, with Drupal Rector, based on Drupal 8 Rector, and added a bunch of checks. And then Palantir continued to fund Matt Glamen on Words to add even more checks to this tool so they have a complete check system. And this allowed Ted Bowman at Acquia to put this all together and write the project update by itself in collaboration with the Drupal Association so that now this checks the readiness of projects and also runs these fixes and posts them in the issue queue. So that was ready for Drupal 9. And it was fine for Drupal 9, but it was not yet ready for Drupal 10. And then the time came for Drupal 10, and we needed somebody to step in. And that's where Bjorn showed up in one of the Drupal 10 meetings and said, by the way, I can help with porting this to Drupal 10. So he's from, uh, from the Netherlands. He was working with porting this to Drupal 10 and to Drupal CI as well, so to have it run as a gen uh, to uh, GitLab CI, sorry, to have it run as a general tool. And that's where we are now. So this runs upgrade status first and checks if there's anything to fix, then fixes it with Drupal Rector, then runs upgrade status again if there was anything left to fix. If there was nothing left to fix, it also fixes the info file and the composer file and posts the patch. If there was stuff, stuff to fix, then it posts the uh, halfway patch that's uh, already helpful for people. And this is the c accidental collaboration 
of all of these companies that sort of came together showing up because they had an interest in solving these problems, sometimes because they built something for themselves, sometimes because they've seen the call for uh, help on these different uh, areas that we are. And there's more opportunities to get involved in this because now we need to make this work with GitLab merge requests because patches are not gonna be there for long anymore. So we need somebody to stand up and work on making this compatible with GitLab so that it can post GitLab merge requests and update GitLab merge requests automatically instead of posting patches. Then the next step would be to integrate the writing of rector rules and PHP stand checks somehow inside the core development process so it's not an afterthought that two people on the side do but more integrated in the whole process. So that would be really nice to uh, figure out. They're still in discussion. And then finally, it would be really important to make this happen earlier so it's not a big, big bang update at the end when a new major version comes out, but more like a regular cadence where the country projects can be updated for the next major version. As time goes on, this requires some changes to the rector rules as well to have backwards compatible code in them too. So that's uh, an exciting challenge as well for somebody in the audience. But in the meantime, if you have a Drupal.org project, it's very likely that the bot is there with a the patch in your queue. So look at your queue and check the bot patch, uh, verify it, see if it works. And thanks to all of the contributors I mentioned and all of the companies that funded their work to make the project update bot happen. So that's how a happenstance of various companies' interest in open source contribution makes a critical tool for the community happen. So as a reminder, if you have the uh, app of the conference, then you can go in the program, find the session, find the live Q&A tab there, and submit your questions there. This is not live, so there may be questions. Uh, so go there and submit your questions and also vote on the existing questions or wait for the mic at the end of the session, but we have a bunch of more speakers with interesting content. And next up is Neil Drum from the Drupal Association. Uh, so, yeah, I've been working on the GitLab Acceleration Initiative with the Drupal Association, and the main goal there is to improve contributor tools on Drupal.org. So it's not just GitLab. Uh, we have a couple other tools in there as well. So uh, yeah, I'm Neil Drum, uh, work on the engineering team at the Drupal Association. Uh, so we're the ones who keep Drupal.org running, uh, including all the subsites, uh, Drupal CI, of course, get.drupalcode.org, and uh, more stuff behind the scenes. Uh, so with get.drupalcode.org, we decided to install GitLab to improve the developer tools on Drupal.org. We're a pretty small team, uh, and you know, we started out not using all the capabilities to GitLab, and um, you know, we only use more of that because there's more that GitLab provides uh, on top of just the repositories that we're using. So uh, it's uh, a lot of Parts of this project are kind of attacking in parallel, despite only being a couple people. Uh, and a lot of this also helps upgrade uh, Drupal.org, uh, which is unfortunately still running on Drupal 7. Uh, so account creation, this is the part that's uh, not GitLab. It's uh, basically, you know, we want to improve the whole contributor experience, make it easier to get an account, easier to log in. Uh, we have a kind of bespoke single sign-on system called Bakery that uh, we're not going to uh, want to use in Drupal 9 uh, or 10. So account creation, it'll look a little different. Uh, pretty soon in the next couple weeks, you'll see the email addresses that you edit on your Drupal.org profile move to git.drupalcode.org. Uh, and uh, don't be worried if the login page looks slightly different in uh, you know, a few weeks, couple months, uh, once we get that launched. Projects and releases, those aren't changing too much. Those are staying on Drupal.org. Uh, there's a lot of integration with packaging that Drupal core expects, and uh, the composer integration uh, at packages.drupal.org has some stuff that you know, we can't build on top of GitLab. Uh, and getting ready for the upgrade to Drupal 9, we want to simplify Drupal.org, kind of get rid of some of the uh, stuff 
that uh, we shouldn't upgrade. Uh, so notifications, GitLab's better at its own notifications, of course, SSH, SSH keys, uh, GPG keys, those are all managed on uh, GitLab. Uh, project pages will have a little bit of simplification. Uh, most of that's done already, so uh, you may remember uh, last year there was you know, account of commits, that's just uh, pictures of the ma maintainers now. And now that's because we were maintaining a, a database of all of the commits that was just, that was the most, the, most of the maintenance on uh, the old systems. So anywhere there, where there's commit counts, it's being simplified and we're gonna lean more on GitLab to do statistics and everything and link over to your get.drupalcode.org profile for more. Uh, the main thing that's in progress right now is uh, GitLab CI. Uh, a few projects have opted into that. Uh, and uh, it's going to, since it's a more generic tool, more powerful, powerful tool, it's gonna require uh, work from all the project maintainers on Drupal.org to switch over. Uh, there's going to be a GitLab CI YAML file that uh, you know, we wanna template out and get as much of the heavy, heavy lifting as done as possible, but uh, every maintainer will likely have to commit a GitLab CI YAML file to leverage that template. And we're overall trying to make the transition easy. And you know, we have to transition everything. We're gonna shut down Drupal CI when this is done. Uh, so both core and contrib, uh, current Drupal, legacy Drupal 7, uh, all the steps that uh, you expect from Drupal CI, we want those to run uh, smoothly out of the box. Uh, and that's all because uh, you know GitLab uh, CI, it doesn't know what a patch file is. So uh, you know projects will switch project by project when they switch over their testing. And when, once a project is switched to GitLab CI, then uh, that maintainer is also saying they don't uh, accept patch files anymore. Everything will be a merge request. Um, and what we're trying to do is. Uh, make sure we preserve the collaborative nature of uh, Drupal.org. I, I think in, there's many more uh, people working on any given issue in Drupal than other communities, uh, five people per core issue. And uh, we wanna also preserve the issue credit system. Uh, so uh, right now uh, our plan is to rebuild it on Drupal uh, unless uh, GitLab gets uh, some tools for that. Uh, so yeah, we want to preserve that as much as possible because uh, it helps motivate a lot of people and companies uh, to contribute. And you know, before we do the migration, uh, there's all these references, entity references to issues throughout Drupal.org, uh, which you know, there's gonna, those are going to stop working when it's on a separate piece of software. So you know, all of these uh, red and green issues everywhere uh, on chain directories, everything those will change. Uh, and then the actual migration. Uh, so we've gotten a head start on some of the scripts for that. Uh, so we have a proof of concept and you know, it's a migration. We're gonna test that over and over again. And eventually, uh, once projects are on GitLab CI, then they can move to issues, so project by project. And uh, so, yeah, that's everything. Uh, you know, we've been working on a lot of stuff in parallel, so you're gonna see more changes in the next few months. Uh, as we kind of get through that backlog and start launching single sign-on uh, and finishing up the last bits of simplifying Drupal.org and GitLab CI and issues. So uh, we'll have a general Drupal.org update session tomorrow. Uh, there's a meta issue to follow on Drupal.org. Uh, join us on Drupal Slack and uh, look for ways to use GitLab more, use the merge requests. Uh, if you want to help with the templates for GitLab CI, I'll get that working for everyone. Uh, yeah, join us. Thank you, Neil. Uh, I'm one of the beta testers of the, uh, of the GitLab CI initiative, and it's been a great experience with how things move forward. So next up is Marine Gandhi, and she's going to introduce us to a whole new initiative. Introducing, for the first time ever, in DrupalCon Prague, a new initiative. In a world where Drupal 10 is on the verge of release, 
a major tool in our ecosystem is still running on Drupal 7. And it's localized at drupal.org. <laughs> this undercover website <laughs> operates in the dark to provide localized strings to all our um, agents in the world. Um, and so a small group of people has decided to take matters into their own hands and to modernize it. And they call themselves the Localize Initiative. Coming soon, very soon, as in today soon. <laughs> so it all began in Belgium in April this year. And I remember it well, because I was there and I saw it all. Um, a group of French speakers decided to follow around Gabor and Drum and just ask them endless questions about code they made 15 years ago. And we were pretty much like puppies around them, like, yeah, 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 help us out. And so that's when we decided to make it an initiative. So I'm not actually the initiative lead. I'm just place holding here for Philip, and he will talk to you more in detail uh, in a session later today. And um, you can ask him any question you want, and you can find us with our nice T-shirts and logos. You know. Um, so what is localized? Because you may not be familiar with this website at all. Uh, so you can call it L10N, because we like to make it simple. Um, but it, basically, it's a translation server. This is where the translation team from all the countries go and uh, collaborate and translate the English from uh, the Drupal core and modules to their own languages. And we need to thread carefully because it's uh, used very much and you download strings every time you install Drupal. So to do that, we have a plan. And this is our roadmap. So first, we really need to just take the Drupal 7 code and make it work um, with Drupal 9. So check if we can use any other tools instead of staying on Drupal. Um, migrate the data, port the modules, all that stuff, and then, you know, if we do all that, then it will be done, right? Well, wrong. <laughs> After that, we have, of course, to refactor, and probably we will change some elements with a more modern approach, like maybe use a REST API, but we don't know yet. Of course, we need to focus on performance because this is heavily used, and maybe make the code consistent because there are lots of us working on the same code base, right? Then, of course, we want to make it pretty for you so that you will want to use it. Um, the front-end theme is uh, basic, but it's working. But I think we can do better, so um, that will be our next focus. Also, we have feedback from the teams that the UX might be quite tricky, so if we can uh, make this better, then, of course, we will. Then, of course, make it reliable. <laughs> because it's a Drupal.org website and we need to be sure that what we push will not break everything. <laughs> so we will test, test, and test some more. Then finally, we will get to uh, take it uh, live and make it uh, uh, available to everybody and working with our infra team and how we can deploy this with the least amount of downtime is yet to be defined. <laughs> So this is one of our big challenges. And then, of course, when everything is done, we can always improve. So we will make it better by introducing new features, because once we're on Drupal 9, then obviously it's much easier to add, add up to that. And uh, you can actually help us do that by filling out a feedback form that we created. So it's very easy, you just scan our QR codes, you will find them on our country broom and in the next community events table, uh, you can grab them. And if you've ever used the website before, please come and fill that, it will help us in the long run. You can also join our initiative for a number of other subjects, like if you like coding, of course, PHP and front-end developers are always very welcome but you can also be interested in data migration. That's a big part of our uh, problem here. And uh, there's actually even more to do because we are very interested in documentation. Like how do you use this website that you may not even know about? Um, so every help is welcome. 
organization, you know how it is. We're a team, we're all in a different country, so we need help. The funny slides, though, it's already covered, sorry. <laughs> but <laughs> obviously, the more the merrier. Uh, if you don't know this uh, website at all yet, uh, please go and check it out now, because while we're working, uh, it's still open, obviously. It's still working. Get familiar with it. Just get a grip of how it's working, because then we will need your feedback in the long run, and your translation teams locally will really be happy with it. Uh, current status, then we're still in step one, obviously. Uh, we have a working Drupal 9 instance. We decided to stay on Drupal because it made sense for us. Uh, we can see projects and their release, and the front-end team is working properly. Thank you for that. Um, and But then we have still a lot of things to do. We have to uh, get user groups working. That's very important because there are different roles. Not everybody can just come and translate any strings. That would be a problem. Um, and then we have a number of bugs and, uh, of course, the infamous uh, data migration. So if you want to know more, please come today to our full 20-minute session um, with other members of the initiative. And then we will have a, a birds of a feather tomorrow in room D2. And you can find us uh, anytime. Uh, with these t-shirts in the room C3, we have a spot for you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, I think this is a really great example of a, of a random group of people that showed up and they said that we want to make this uh, community initiative happen without anybody telling them that, that they would need to do that. So thank you. A lot of people will be grateful for the results and will be happy to be involved in the future as well. So next up is Alex Pat, and he will talk about the distributions and recipes initiative. Hello everyone, I'm here today to talk to you about the Distribution and Recipes Initiative. I'm going to tell you about our goals, what we've been doing, what we're going to do, and our future plans. But distributions are not new. <coughs> Back in 2006, Dries wrote on his blog, Distributions, I hope it all works out. <laughs> so we're still here, we're still talking about distributions. And he wrote that because Dean Space had been really successful at introducing Drupal to the world, and he was envisaging a world where people would be able to start their Drupal doing all sorts of fantastic things. But 11 years later, he wrote, we've improved the underlying technology for building distributions, and we will continue to do so for years to come. But unfortunately, some distributions haven't managed to stay the course, because it's tricky to maintain distributions. So we've created this initiative to improve that. So our first goal is to improve distribution discovery. When you start to install Drupal, you have three options. You have standard, minimal, and demo umami. That's not all that's there. There's commerce kickstart, there's open social, there's Varbase, there's fantastic ways of starting, but you don't see them, you don't know, you wouldn't know that they existed. But also, once you've made your choice, if you start with standard, you can't then later on have another distribution. So we want you to be able to have more than one, benefit from more than one of the, the work from the distribution. So that if you want a great blogging platform, you can also have a great commerce platform by using the commerce kickstart distribution. And as I was saying, this should happen at any time in the project cycle, not just when you meet the installer and go, okay, I'm gonna use Thunder or Open Social. It doesn't work, you, your, your, your needs change as, the site, as your site develops. You, you might be want to start selling things, you want to use Commerce Kickstart, you cannot use Commerce Kickstart because your site is already a blogging site. We also want to make it easier to update. We've had too many distributions do really great contributions that haven't managed to get to the next version of Drupal. <coughs> and last but not least, we also want to enable distributions to ship demo content. It's really important that when you install a distribution, you can actually see how it works. We suffer from that when you install standard, you just get to an empty page which might welcome you to Drupal, but you don't know what's the next steps. Demo Umami proved the value of having default content there. 
you install the demo, you see some great recipes, you're like, oh, that's how Drupal can work. So what are we going to build? We're going to build a new thing, not distributions. We're going to build Drupal recipes. It's yet another YAML file. And what it really is is a list of steps to add functionality to your site. You can achieve the same thing by clicking through the user interface, but it's much quicker if a machine can do it for you. So what recipes, what will they be able to do? They're going to be able to install modules, as you'd expect, install themes. They're going to be able to create and update configuration. They're going to be able to create content. And they will be able to also apply other recipes. But what won't they be able to do? So recipes won't be able to have their own code. There's nothing dynamic. They're not going to be another module, another way of providing the same functionality again. And this is really important because if recipes describe just what the site can do, then we don't have to worry so much about how do we update complex APIs and stuff. Recipes are a description of your site. They're not functionality themselves. So what have we built so far? We've written a lot of documentation because some of these concepts are quite technical about how we want recipes to not be changeable, how we want them to be <coughs> descriptive of your site. But we've also already got a, a patch that can install modules, create an update configuration, and apply other recipes. What are we currently working on? We're looking at converting standard and demo umami into recipes so that we can learn from that experience, so that we can share that way of building recipes with the other distributions like Open Social and Commerce Kits, so they can use the same base recipes. And we're also starting to work out how to do default content. Once we've done that, we're going to have a UI and core for applying recipes. We're going to try and host recipes on Drupal.org. And obviously, we want to have certain recipes selectable from the installer. And to do that, we're hoping to leverage the project browser that Leslie was talking about earlier. And once we've got all of that done, obviously, we're going to eat some cake. And then we're going to build some testing harnesses on Drupal.org so that recipes will be tested without you having to work out which versions of modules in Drupal core that they apply to. We also want a CLI and a GUI tool in order to help people build and contribute recipes back to the community. Where are we doing all of this? There's the <coughs> our own project, the distribution underscore recipes project, and this project contains instructions of how to apply the patch to your project and it links to all of our documentation. Who is doing all of this work? Well, at the moment, a lot of it's just me, but there's also the Drupal Association. Mixologic is helping improve Drupal.org for the way that it manages distributions already. There's people like Fabian Bercher who's helping me work on the config side of things. I've got distribution maintainers who've got a lot of experience in building these distributions saying, hey, have you thought about this? And there's other community members. But I would really like you to come and join us because we need more people. So come to my talk tomorrow at 5.15 in the room C1 at Acquia um, to learn more. Come to the Friday contribution sprint. There'll be a table there with recipes written on, on it. And join us in Slack at hash distributions and recipes. We have a bi-weekly meeting every Tuesday. Bi-weekly, not, uh, not every Tuesday, every other Tuesday. Thank you. Thank you, Alex. Uh, just imagine the possibility of project browser with recipes where you can get all of these projects pre-configured with demo content and would make it much easier to explore all the functionality that's been hidden in the, those 9,000 modules on Drupal.org. So I'm really excited for what all of this would bring. And to top this all off, Ted Bowman is going to talk about automatically updating all of these things and how the community made uh, the automatic update system even better. Hi, thanks. I'm Ted Bowman, Ted Bow on Drupal.org. I'm a software engineer at Acquia and the tech lead for the auto updates uh, initiative. And I'm going to go through our progress since Portland and at Portland, and also how we're uh, helping out the project browser initiative. So in Portland, we did beta testing because we had a beta module at that point, and we had about 30 plus beta testers there and more later. Um, we had 15 bugs and features that were fixed there, and it was really useful to get people's eyes on the module who weren't, you know, the people who were seeing it day to day and kind of just like miss the small things, especially so there was a lot of UX improvements. 
So for example, Adam P. found that during the update process, the site goes into maintenance mode and then we take you out of maintenance mode. But at the end of the process, we were still telling you you were in maintenance mode. So we had just like missed that. Um, so he found that and we fixed that. That's no longer there. Another example is Shiraz Dindar found that um, on our experimental module, Automatic Updates Extensions, which lets you update themes and modules, you couldn't actually check for the updates. You couldn't refresh. So if you knew a, a security update had just come out, you couldn't click check manually and see the update. So we added that. Um, Michelle Herman found that on the up the available updates page with the update module provides, we still had download links to tar files. And of course, that's not going to work with our new composer-based system. So we got rid of those. And now, drum roll, OK, there is links to our form on the available updates page. And we removed the links for any of uh, the, the particular releases that you wouldn't see on our form, and we left the release notes, which then will tell you how to install it via Composer out on Drupal.org. And Sarah Corbine found that in our beta testing instructions, we had particular instructions for if the module couldn't automatically find Composer, this is how you can set it in settings.php, but we didn't actually have that, those same instructions in the in-module help. So we were able to transfer that to have it so basically you don't have to just be a beta tester. And Lisa found out that in certain situations, the update would time out and when it's applying. And that's the most dangerous time to have a timeout because you could have a half updated site. So we've uh, fixed that so that process can take as long as it needs to to apply the update to your site. Uh, T. Franz found that in certain situations, Composer was not running with the same PHP interpreter as Drupal itself, so we have a more flexible way to actually find the Composer um, executable. And finally, um, our Kohler found that we had messages about backing up your database and code before you start an update just in case something goes wrong, but uh, he was able to help us really improve the documentation the links to documentation and the in-module text to really warn you like, yeah, you should really do a backup. And that was a really great help. So that and a lot of other work has led us to a stable version of the contrib module. It can update Drupal core. We have an experimental module to update themes um, and modules. So please try it out. Um, we're at 8.x2.1 now, and this is available today. Um, and also, while we're here, we're going to do more testing right after this in D2. Um, if you come by, we're really looking for testers that can test on remote hosting. We want to test this as much as possible as we go towards core. Um, so yeah, if you, there's instructions. If you come, we'll sort of like walk you through the process. And then there's a report form. You get contribution credit for trying it out. Tell us what went, you know, if it went well, if it didn't go well. You know, you'll probably find some improvements that we missed, like the people in Portland did. So, yeah, afterwards, we have two sessions back to back because sometimes it makes take longer, but it's in the schedule. Um, it'd be great to see you there. Um, so, with the project browser team, uh, we've been working to t let them take advantage of our composer um, operation functionality we have in the auto op automatic updates module. We ship with a module called Package Manager which then calls a PHP library we made called Composer Stager. And so Project Browser will also use Package Manager and Composer Stager to install modules in a Composer um, native way. So that's in progress work right now. And so we're moving a lot of the validation that used to be only in automatic updates down to Project Browser, down to Package Manager, so anybody can take advantage of it. For example, a lot of sites are going to have modules that aren't installed by a composer, even though you know that's the recommended way. So we're doing a lot of validation to make sure that any new modules you install or any dependencies that are updated do not conflict with something that's not managed by composer. So we tell you, oh, sorry, you know, you need to figure out this in a more composer-friendly way first. The other thing that we're working on is the update module in Drupal core wasn't really meant to check on security information for modules that aren't currently in your 
code base, but of course, with Project Browser installing new modules, we need security information. And we need to validate that security information um, with the update XML from Drupal.org. So now any module that you install or update can be validated and make sure it's secu secure, supported, and published on Drupal.org. Um, so all of that and other validation, we're moving down to package manager so that Project Browser or any other module that wants to do through the UI Composer operations can take advantage of it. Probably recipes will be doing some composer operations. And so they'll get that validation and as we continue to add more validation. So package manager, if you're a, a module developer, this is ready to be worked on, um, to be extended. Um, you can help contribute. So anything you contribute to sort of the package manager ecosystem uh, will, will benefit automatic updates, project browser, and hopefully more contrib modules. Uh, find us on Friday at the contribution day. Tomorrow I have a sort of developer-oriented session about Package Manager, um, so please come by. Thanks. Thank you, Tad. Uh, so imagine the combination of all of these uh, with your contributions that may show up in a future DrupalCon with your friendly face on a slide. It would make Drupal so much more powerful. So looking forward to involving you in these things. Uh, right after this session, there's both the uh, Project Browser and the Automatic Updates teams are doing their two-hour user testing sessions in the buff rooms. So look for them there and pick your topic. And with this, I would like to hand this over to Lenny, who's going to lead our Q&A. Thank you, Gardner. So that's like you had your share of fun, guys, with talking. So now it's for the audience to have their share. Uh, we have questions, of course, that were posted online. But of course, we would like to hear from you guys who are present over here. So go on, raise your hands, and let's get it started. OK, so you are warm enough, so we can start then with the questions that we received online. So the first one is that uh, gets the most, uh, uh, the biggest number of the votes is uh, how would the project browser initiative work with composer managed projects? Um, yeah, so. Like I said, we have the sub-module package manager. That it now is being is basically packaged with auto-updates just because we needed one place to have the sort of stack that we were working on. In core, depending on if automatic updates were to get into core first before Project Browser, then Project Browser would just use that module there. It does actually do, um, it does do com uh, actual composer calls. It's not like a, it's nothing sort of, it is, special, but it's, it's not unique, a different way of doing it. It stages any composer operation in a separate directory, uh, and then so we can check certain things about it, make sure it's secure, make sure it didn't update things we weren't expecting. Um, so then it transfers everything back over, and that last step is not really composer aware, but it's just basically you have your active site, you have the site that had the composer operation done on, done on it, and then it transfers over. So your code's updated, your composer JSON, your composer lock files are all updated in the process. Okay, one second. Sure. Yeah, so just for those of you who aren't quite as technical in the audience, uh, Project Browse will not only allow you to go out and find modules uh, right from within your website, but also to install them from for you. So you're not gonna have to go out to a, to a terminal and figure out Composer and all that stuff. So that's a huge win, and, and Ted's team is um, working on that. Thank you. The next question in that case uh, is from Alexander, and he's wondering if we are getting rid of patches. Uh, yes. Uh, yeah, GitLab. Uh, yeah, we're, the big goal is to move to uh, issues on GitLab, uh, and that means um, merge requests for the code changes. and. Uh, yeah, that will require GitLab CI, and none of this knows what patches are. It's all going to be merge requests. Are you migrating the existing patches to merge requests? Um, that's, that's more of a stretch goal. Probably not. We're going to migrate all of the files that have been attached, all the screenshots, 
patches, everything. Um, but um, yeah, getting a patch into a merge request, um, I would say it would probably work you know, 20 to 50% of the time if, it, if you trusted a computer to do it. Uh, so yeah, but you would have the patch available on the, as an yeah. attachment. Yep. Yep. All right. Thank you. Any questions from the uh, from the auditory? All right. Everyone is using application, so we are very happy about that. <laughs> okay. The next one then. What is the timeline to upgrade Drupal org to Drupal nine slash ten slash eleven? That's a good one. <laughs> yeah, it's a good question. Um, <laughs> Uh, so, yeah, it's hard to predict since we're such a small team and stuff like, um, I, don't know if, I don't know if everyone noticed, uh, but especially for the European time zones, GitLab was, uh, git.drupalcode.org was pretty slow the last month or so. Uh, so, you know, that stuff like that takes, uh, you know, days or weeks out of our timeline to fix the production infrastructure. Um, that one we took a little extra time because we wanted to get our configuration management updated uh, so we can uh, roll out new servers, uh, you know, maybe a server local to Europe so it's even faster, um, more quickly. So, uh, yes, yeah, I can't really provide a honest timeline uh, since we're such a small team and things, uh, things take time. Marini, you want to answer it as well? <laughs> yeah, even if it's only a part of Drupal.org, we don't have a timeline for localized either, because yeah, we're more yeah we're more than your infra team actually, <laughs> but we're still doing that on our free time, and there's so much to do that it's hard to get in sync sometimes. So yeah. Yeah, but it's a it's, it's it's about volunteers showing up to do that would help a lot in porting a lot of things. So most of the sites are very well contained. Like if you want to work on API.drupal.org or localize.drupal.org, then you can uh, work on them. Then localize has its own team now to make this happen. All right, thank you. Next question then. Receipts. What are the solutions for default content being considered? Uh, for example, default content module. So um, we, we have an open issue to discuss that. We are considering anything. I mean, in Demo Umami uses a, a CSV file and uploads from there. Uh, some of the distributions use default content, the default content module. Um, personally, I like that one because it means that the entities are all stored in YAML, which would make the same as the recipe YAML and the config YAMLs that are there, so everything. There's a consistency there, but we haven't made that decision yet. Um, so yeah, there's an issue. Please come and contribute. Thank you for your answer. Uh, the next question is, what happened to commit count on Drupal profiles? So the commit count of Drupal uh, sorry, uh, what happened to commit count on Drupal profiles and module pages? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, uh, they took it away the moment I had more commits than Dries. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the, so, uh, the main effort we put into maintaining the old Git infrastructure, um, which was pretty minimal, it was um, maintaining a database in Drupal of uh, all of the commits. So basically a mirror of all the Git metadata in a Drupal database with entities and everything. Uh, and you know, since GitLab's extra work to do all of this migration and integration, um, that's that's what had to fall off, all of that syncing and everything. And GitLab does, GitLab can count commits itself and knows how to count those uh, a bit better than us. All right, thanks. The, the following question is uh, related to the automatic updates. And uh, Christopher is wondering, does automatic updates work for the multi-site systems? Um, so right now we don't support multi-sites because um, two people can't update 
at the same time. And there's a lot of things that we restrict during the apply process. So basically the very last point where you're applying, your site is sort of restricted. You can't uninstall modules, you can't install modules um, because it's really dangerous to have your code being updated at the same time you're doing actions on your site. So if we allowed multi-site right now, we basically would have to have some locking system outside of Drupal itself to tell all the sites that, that okay, you don't, can't do these particular operations. So as an MVP in the contrib module, we decided not to support it. Um, if people are, we actually haven't got a, many requests or any requests in the issue queue to support it. But if people are interested in the problem, please you know, come on Friday or post an issue. Um, it's a very tricky, very tricky problem. So, um, yeah, I mean, one thought I had was to say, okay, maybe in sites.php you would specify this site can perform these operations, but the rest of them won't. But you still have to have the, solve the problem of, okay, if one site can do an update, all these other ones have to be made aware that the update is happening so they can't do certain things while the update is applying. So it's a tricky problem, but if people are interested in solving it, um, we could use help. All right, that's a wonderful answer. Uh, and the next one is about the bots. So does the bot detect depend uh, deprecations on the dependency modules? Does the bot detect the, de the dependent module deprecations? That was the question. Yeah, so does the bot detect the deprecations on dependency modules? No, well, so it can only install a module if it can install of the dependencies in the environment in Drupal 9 currently. So it's checking the deprecations uh, within the module itself, but if it depends on APIs in other modules, the PHP 10 Drupal would go through all of the APIs that it depends on and detect the deprecations for those. But for any code that's not being used from the dependent module in the module being checked, it would not find those deprecations. Yeah. Thank you, Gava. Now let's jump to the GitLab. So um, who will pay for the TI CI runners and is that a large cost point for the Drupal Association? Uh, so the overall the cost will be approximately the same. Uh, you know, we're, there'll be some superficial changes like they'll run via Kubernetes uh, instead of uh, spinning up in the EC2 instance. But overall, you know, the same amount of compute costs the same amount, uh, no matter how you tell AWS to, uh, to run it. Um, the, we do have to be careful about uh, get, uh, or Drupal CI has some kind of rails in the UI, so you can only select one configuration, like one version of PHP, one version of MySQL for the default testing for issues. Uh, and, you know, GitLab CI, there's no affordances like that. You can make a matrix of, uh, you know, test all 100 combinations of PHP, MySQL, the other databases, all of the other things. So, you know, if everyone does that, that'll cost more. Um, we likely will need to put a number of minutes limit for each project, uh, uh, getting some help with uh, some con contractors to make that possible in GitLab. Uh, so, uh, there will be kind of a base amount of minutes we think is enough for most projects. If there's a project that is doing good things and legitimately needs more minutes, yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll give out more. Drupal core will need a few more minutes for testing. Uh, but uh, yeah, we're keeping an eye on costs because uh, yeah, Drupal CI, it's you know, three or $4,000 a month uh, for that compute, uh, which is generously paid for by our supporting partners, and yeah. Thank you for your answer, Neil. And uh, now the next one is for the localization initiative, finally. Uh, can we, will we be able to run this uh, localization server ourselves? Uh, this, uh, this could be really useful in enterprise environments. The, which initiative? Localization. Oh, localization. Local 
Can you repeat? I don't hear you very well. Oh, sorry. Absolutely. So, uh, uh, sh like, would, would it, w will there be the possibility to run the localization server uh, ourselves for the? Yeah. Yeah, I guess <laughs> if you want. <laughs> I mean, the the code is all open source. It's uh, it's uh, just. Uh, find the modules starting with L10N and you will find all the contrib modules that make it work. So obviously you can take it and try it yourself. Sure. All right, that's good to know, I guess. Uh, the next one is regarding GitLab CI. So uh, will you provide the default, Git, default GitLab CI configuration for small modules that only need simple link checks? Uh, uh, CI for small modules. Um, yeah, yeah I, the default will probably, uh, yeah, we'll have to find like the right balance of, uh, yeah, have it work out of the box for a small module, basic configuration, uh, and then uh, the GitLab CI, you know, uh, my understanding of it is just layers of YAML, so you can layer on more complexity as you need it. Okay, and um, there is one more question for you, Nim. So is there a risk that remote commit counts on the, uh, uh, the, sensitive, the sensitive times uh, cross collaboration? A risk of? Yeah, so is there a risk for, the, uh, for removing commit counts on uh, Drupal org? So it will desensitize cross collaboration. Um, so the commit counts have, have been gone for uh, at least a couple months now, if not four or five months. Um, and uh, yeah, it's hard to say what how that's affected the community because uh, really the main driver it's it's the project itself. It's uh, you know Drupal 10s coming up. There's a lot more. You know you have the rector bot posting patches like that's. That's what drives the development cycle. So it's the product. It's, it, it shouldn't worry about counting things. Yeah, but like uh, I think that's where this uh, the, this question is coming from. It's not about the count itself. It's about like making people more like elaborate, etc. So do we do we have any metrics that uh, perhaps would help us to understand? Yeah, that? we could we could look into it more. But yeah. uh, as far as like actual development, um, it's yeah, it's the Drupal core release cycle that drives things, uh, and also. You know, commit counts, those only counted code contributions. We also want, uh, you know, we're going to keep the, con uh, the issue credits, uh, and that counts more than code contribution. Uh, and we want to make sure we're uh, looking at all of the effort uh, that goes into the uh, project, not just code. Mm -hmm. OK, thank you. So I will check once again if there is anyone who would like uh, uh, to ask a question directly here. Okay. Then we keep working with the online questions. So the next one is uh, uh, regarding, so it makes sense to migrate the issue related data to GitLab. We make Drupal org a brochure site and separate the code contribution and modules themes on GitLab. So it's about comparison, like where uh, like if it makes sense to use GitLab or, uh, or GitHub. So once again, uh, it makes sense to migrate the issue related data to GitLab. We make Drupal org a brochure site and separate the code contribution module themes on GitLab. So yeah, there's a lot more on Drupal.org than just the um, just the issues. Uh, and so there's also the change records that Drupal core uh, mostly uses uh, to help pe inform people about updates. Uh, the issue credit system that um, and uh, organizations and um, yeah the organizations marketplace and yeah there's a lot to it and uh, really we can do some splitting up of the site like uh, API and localized being separate sites I think has been good uh, but um, you know, especially with the marketplace, we want to be able to entity reference to all of these uh, sites and any kind of negligible benefit we have from simplifying the site, we would have to replace with all sorts of data syncing to do the marketplace ranking. And, you know, sometimes more sites is 
uh, more work. Okay, great, thank you, Neil. So the next one is related to the project browser again. So can it tell you if the core modules will do what you need? When I was uh, starting out, I was constantly searching for contributors uh, modules for tasks when what I needed was in core. So perhaps it's related once again to the problem of the description that you were mentioning. So you were asking about um, core modules? Yes, yes. So can, can basically, will be project browser able to tell the, uh, the, the, the developer, the contributors, if a uh, core module will do what, what they actually need to be done? Yeah. Yes, yeah, so when you're searching for the modules, by default, you're going to get contrib modules. Uh, we also have implemented something called sources, which is hidden behind an advanced filter will you be able to bring in other sources of data, including the core modules. Maybe you're uh, you know, at Stanford and you have your own set of modules you want to use, so you'll be able to use your set of modules or Acquia's or whoever's sets of modules. So those are like advanced filters. But the logic in terms of what to bring in, I think relates back to Ted's um, update initiative where it decides you know, what libraries, whatever you need to bring in. So that's a little more complicated than you know, just where the person searching for the modules uh, is searching. But the default is to search contrib, and then you can go out and search other places as well. Thank you. So the following question is regarding, uh, is related to CK Editor 5. So will uh, CK Editor 5 have a help wizard for new users to see uh, new features and how to switch to a new version easily? So we have some uh, documentation on Drupal.org about the upgrade process itself. Uh, I don't think we have documentation on Drupal.org about the new features of CK Editor 5 itself. Uh, there's documentation about that on CK Editor 5's documentation, and we have two sections at the DrupalCon about that as well, where we have both the CK Editor 5 folks talking about this from their perspective, and then I will be presenting on Thursday from sort of Drupal's pr perspective a little bit more and the upgrade path. So um, we have some documentation, um, maybe not necessarily exactly what is, what is being asked, asked there, but sort of along those lines. All right, and I think like we can continue a little bit with uh, CK Editor 5 uh, as a follow-up question. There is, uh, will the CK Editor 5 integration pave the way for real-time collaborative editing? multiple ed uh, editors uh, at the same time? Um, so CK Editor 5, one of the reasons why CK Editor decided to rewrite CK Editor was to enable real-time collaboration features yeah. in CK Editor. Um, I know that the CK source is working on a premium version of the CK Editor module that provides those features. Um, I believe that they will be mentioning and providing more information about that in their session. They also have a booth here where I'm more than certain that they, will, they would be happy to provide more information about those things. Uh, the reason why those services are provided as a premium service, paid service, is because of re it, it requires a third-party com uh, component, so Drupal itself can't provide it. Uh, so there, there's a hosted piece that is required for the conflict resolution. Um, but yeah, I think it is sort of paving a way towards that kind of future where Drupal could be done, uh, used for real-time collaboration. So we have time for one more question. And uh, yeah, there is, uh, any, is there any update on the decoupled menu initiative? <laughs> is there any update on the decoupled menu initiative? <laughs> So I think it's really close to being added, added to core. Uh, there's been progress on that. Uh, there's been some changes in the people who are, who are working on that because if people have changed jobs, they've had changes in their, in their lives because of COVID and other reasons. So uh, because of that, it has taken a little bit longer than we anticipated. But yeah, it, it, it is moving forward and I think it is going to be done sometime soon. <laughs> All right, and that's why we are out of time, so I will take my mo a moment to thank every one of the speakers.
as well, thank you everyone who uh, posted your questions and uh, yeah, for, the, for being involved in this conversation. Thank you. Customer expectations. They're always shifting, changing, reinventing. And the path to digital transformation is always evolving to meet them. This requires integrating new technologies, communicating and deploying across a myriad of touch points, devices and channels. Which is why you need a digital experience platform as a central technological foundation for digital customer experiences. Acquia's OpenDXP gives you the ability to seamlessly integrate back-end and front-end systems across it. All backed up by the flexibility of Drupal and the market-leading environment for developers and marketers. So you can build and deliver experiences to the right people at the right time. It's the freedom to create new capabilities without starting over. To roll out multiple campaigns in any language. To build and pivot and build again giving you cross-channel continuity across the entire customer journey, putting monolithic solutions behind you and getting out in front of customer demand. That's the power of Acquia DXP.